Here, Jason Rodriguez.
All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. All way up calls to plead. Draw near. Give attention. You shall be heard. God save the United States. Great state of Florida. This honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court of Florida, please be seated. Good morning and welcome to this session of the Florida Supreme Court. The first case on today's docket is Joseph versus the state of Florida. Counsel? Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chief Justice, other justices, counsel. My name is Fred Susnick. I represent Mr. Joseph here. Uh, feels a little bit strange to be in person in the courtroom. The last time I was not sitting at my- We can relate. <laughs> sitting at my dining room table was for the sentencing in Mr. Joseph's case. Um, I'm gonna address actually just two of the issues here. I think the briefs pretty much cover most all of it and I'm not gonna stand here and go over everything uh, again the first issue I want to address is issue number one, the, where the court did not exclude the testimony of the witness who was uh, listed by the state at the last minute. And when I say the last minute, I don't mean a week before trial. I don't mean uh, uh, two days before trial. This witness was listed as we were picking the jury. The witness did the uh, evaluation that the state had of the evidence while we were picking the jury. And this witness was disclosed to us as we were picking the jury. The deposition of him was done as we were picking the jury. At his deposition, he was listed as a firearms tool mark expert. His deposition was taken as the record would reflect. Uh, and it became clear that the defense needed a witness to rebut him or at least tell us whether or not what he was saying was true. I went through the JAC requirements of having an order done and us looking for an expert, which was being done by other people because I was in the courtroom picking the jury with co-counsel. It became clear by the investigation that my investigator did is that we didn't need a firearm expert, we needed a tool mark expert. There's a difference. A tool mark expert is very, very specialized, and there are none. There are none in Florida that we could find on such short notice. The one we had had moved to Tennessee or somewhere and said he wasn't ever coming back to the state of Florida. I did research, my investigator did research and got information on tool mark experts, uh, we could not find one. This was all presented to the court. Some of the research is in the record, which was presented to the court, that this tool mark expert, which the state apparently needed for this case, otherwise they would not have done it at the last minute, would not have presented it. There seemed to be some concern on their part as to whether or not they had enough evidence to show that which weapon was used, that there was only one weapon used, and who used the weapon, as no weapon was recovered. A motion was filed and argued before judge, the trial court judge in this case, asking for this witness to be excluded as it was disclosed and such short notice. She held a Richardson hearing and found that in fact a Richardson violation had occurred. This was a discovery violation. Mr. Yes. Argument I take is in fact, I believe the judge. That's correct, Your Honor. Interesting. And, uh, but the argument is going to be that you were given an opportunity to hire an expert and you say you cover. Take the practicality of a trial lawyer trying a case 
involving the death penalty in the Taking the jury, being concerned about cross examination, being concerned about everything that goes on during the trial, which is a lot. And at the same token, you're supposed to somehow be looking for someone, uh, an expert, to be able to impeach the state's expert. Uh, what prejudice goes, to, uh, other than just the fact that they were just giving that at the last minute, how does that affect your ability to properly defend a defendant in court? Your Honor, it affects my ability to properly defend a defendant in court in that the state is now presenting evidence that I did not have a chance to thoroughly investigate using my expert to find out whether or not that evidence is proper, whether or not the evidence shows what they say it does, whether or not there's another expert out there who would contradict this expert, whether or not other tests can be done to this. These are all questions that would be done by a trial defense attorney and questions I would do had they, had they uh, submitted a witness to me. They did not. And when the court asks, how is there th th this error? And the court's correct. I was quite occupied in other things and had been prepared for trial. This error is compounded. And by the way, I do find it interesting that I was asked if I'd like to use their expert on my behalf which I, I, I turned down because it was their expert, and I needed my expert to tell me what, what he was doing uh, what was right. But the error is compounded, and, and that was where, part of my argument that I was going was to get into. Further into the trial, the judge denied my motion to exclude the witness and said, we're moving on. She wanted to get the trial moving. They called their witness eventually at the, uh, at the end of the trial, uh, and I was cross-examining him. During my time, whenever I could, and whatever my investigator could do, I was reading and studying what toolmark experts do, what toolmark experts are needed for, what uh, kind of evaluation, what kind of tests they do. And I was thoroughly cross-examining their witness. Uh, I forgot his name at this point. Uh, Felix. What? I think his last name was Felix. Yes, I think so. I was cross-examining him in great detail and asking him questions, and it was getting to the point where he was saying, yeah, other experts could differ with me. As a matter of fact, on page 1650 of the transcript, I believe it's where uh, it started to say, yes, other people could disagree with me. There's other tests that can be done. My method may be not uh, the way other people do. There can be contrary opinions. It was at that point on page 1654 of the transcript on her own, without any objection from the state, the trial court cut me off, said, no more questioning, we're done with this witness. There was clearly more questioning. And that's relevant um, because as yesterday in the Seavers case, Judge Lawson asked a question uh, uh, of uh, the defense attorney uh, when you were talking about, I think it was a two hour videotape, uh, wasn't that videotape thoroughly uh, questioned about, thoroughly cross-examined? Cross-examination was done on that, and you got every question and every answer you uh, wanted on that. You didn't need that tape in. In this situation, no, I didn't. I was cut off from my cross-examination, so I did not get to thoroughly cross-examine their witness because the judge cut me off on her own motion. Counsel, help me understand the exact relevance of this information. I mean, am I correct in understanding we don't have the, the gun no. that was used? No, that's correct, yes. Um, so what, what is this? This is not matching a particular gun to these uh, casings, correct? That's correct. Um, so it, this is all about whether... Uh, one weapon as opposed to more than one weapon That's was correct. used. Well, help me understand how that fits in with the, your theory of the case and the rest of what was uh, presented. I mean, we know we've got evidence came in. I know you contested, uh, but evidence came in that uh, your client was the shooter. Correct? There was evidence to that effect. Right. From, from two, two people. Right? Witnesses which we had objected to their testimony. I understand. I understand. That's a separate issue. Yes. Um, 
But assuming you don't win on that, that and contesting that, I'm trying to figure out how, how this really makes any difference and how this fits into your theory of the case. It makes a difference in that the state's theory was that there was one shooter, one gun, and all this multitude of ammunition, slugs, casings that was all over the place came from one gun. They put this witness on to testify erroneously that only one gun was used to leave an impression with the jury that only one gun was used, that this toolmark expert came in and said, all these casings, all these uh, shells, all of these cartridges, all of these slugs, none of which were tested against each other, all came from one gun. They wanted to leave an impression with the jury that only one gun was used. That's why they called this witness. And their witness deprived me of getting the ability to come in and say, no, there might have been two guns. So this is what it was done for. That's how it's relevant. That's how it's not harmless. You know, as Judge Munoz said yesterday, you asked whether or not the jury had all the evidence they could consider it and disregard what they didn't want. In my case, they didn't. The judge cut me off mid-sentence on her own motion and left the impression with the jury as a result of me stopping in the middle that there was one gun, all these cartridges, and there was a multitude of cartridges came from one gun. And therefore, there was one shooter, one gun, one well, defendant. I, the, 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 uh, I, I showed a little bit with the assumption that more than one gun would necessarily mean more than one shooter. Uh, it, it is certainly known to occur that uh, a single person will use uh, more than one weapon. But as Your Honor pointed out, none of the witnesses said there was multiple well, weapons. Well, and that, but none of, the, none of the witnesses said there, there was uh, 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 anybody else there, and, and none of the witnesses said anybody did it other than uh, uh, your client. That's why they need to have all of the evidence in front of them to make that decision. Uh, Your Honor, there was a multitude of cartridges more cartridges than, and more shells than could have come from one gun, possibly. So that's why it's relevant. That's why the Sometimes judge... Sometimes people reload. I mean, I just, this is just... But there seem to be assumptions here that, that just kind of fly in the face of uh, common experience and reality. Well, assumptions are made when you're presenting evidence and the jury makes a decision when they've heard all the evidence. The problem here is... You are battled with certain assumptions because the state presented the witness at the last moment and the court cut off the cross-examination. So it, 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 the court, I'm hard pressed to say, oh yeah, the I'm making this assumption that there might have been multiple shooters and I have no evidence, but you have no evidence because the state presented a witness that you couldn't rebut and the court wouldn't let you rebut. So, yeah, they're, they're, yes, Your Honor, there there may be assumptions, but that's why you should be allowed to present all of the evidence. I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, if if your defense says there was more than one shooter, more than one gun, I mean, it's, isn't it incumbent upon you to before trial to come up with some kind of evidence and and to be able to present evidence to that to that effect or be prepared? It's, a, it's incumbent upon me to. Uh, present evidence, if necessary, to uh, disprove the state's case. At that point, there were a multitude of uh, shells. There were a multitude of, they were coming in different directions. They were found in different places. That can be done by arguing the evidence, as was talked about yesterday in the, in the Seavers case. Right, I can argue I, that the evidence wasn't there. Sorry. I'm not suggesting you have the burden of proof. Obviously, you do not. but. Uh but to be able to properly cross-examine and test the state's case, it seems like that there's a certain amount you would be prepared to go without waiting on the state's case. As the state I, I said at one point in the transcript, uh, the defendant went down, which would be defense attorney went down and viewed all of the evidence. I did view all of the evidence. I knew all of the evidence they had. I knew what holes they may have in their case. It's not incumbent on me to correct the holes on their case and tell think, them where I'm going. I think what the question is motions. leading to is at, at some juncture, uh, you had an obligation to explain to the judge 
how this or, or this late notice affects your defense that you have planned. At some point in time, the, I think during the Richardson inquiry, which was done after Jeopardy was attached, uh, and that's what I think the judge asked you, well, tell me how this affected your defense. And I think that's the time when you got to tell the judge, uh, okay, judge, this is major stuff. I mean, I plan to go this way. Now they got his expert says it's going that way, and I have no ability to uh, or time to hire someone to come in and possibly contradict that. So did you inform the judge what your theory of the case was and how this affected your defense? I believe I told the court that I needed an expert on to, to, to evaluate the evidence, look at the evidence, and see if and how it would change. Once again, I can't tell the court how it would change my approach if I don't know what uh, the witnesses are going to tell me. And it's at that point the judge said, well, just use their expert. So, Your, Your Honor, the answer is it would change my preparation if their expert, uh, if my expert came and said their expert was not giving me the correct information. You, you can't very well ask an attorney while they're picking a jury, as you say, jeopardy attached, well, how would this evidence that they just gave you that you don't know what the evidence is affect your case? I can't tell the court other than I need my expert to tell me if their expert will do something different so that it possibly changes my case. Well, but, but isn't it true, though, that the, the purpose of an expert that you would have called on toolmark issues would have been to rebut the state's expert? on tool mark issues, right? Well, it, possibly it could have been to rebut it. Not only would it be have been to rebut it, him, but it could also be to put in additional evidence that says not only what that, he did that, was That, however, wrong. sounds like a different problem. That, now we're, in the, now we're in the country of things you might have noticed up, things you might have done. I'm, I'm saying that as a thought experiment, right. let's, let's assume that the state's uh, tool mark expert is fully rebutted. Yes. As a matter of logic, every word that person testified to is now. Okay. Um, help me understand how the theory of defense changes then. I, I, I share the chief's question about how even if there is no evidence in the record that it is a single weapon, right? Let's, let's just assume the state puts on no evidence about how many weapons are involved. It relies on the testimony of the two eyewitnesses, the, the casings where they are, the slugs where they are. Puts on no evidence that it's all from one gun. Help me understand how your theory of the case changes. How, when Your Honor says it's fully rebutted, as Justice Munoz said yesterday, it's for the jury to decide whether or not to accept it or refute it. I don't know if it's fully rebutted. You don't know if it's fully rebutted. The jury is the only one that can determine whether or not it's fully I know, rebutted. I I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm asking, just as a matter of, like, Again, it's sort of a thought exercise here. Let's assume that that testimony all drops out. Assume they'd never called a tool mark expert. Assume this problem never arose from the standpoint of late notice. Okay. What I'm trying to understand is impact on defense. I'm trying to understand how it changes your position, how it ultimately prejudices Mr. Joseph. Well, at that point, we don't know how the trial is going to go. But what we do know is that there isn't going to be a witness that said there was one gun. There's going to be a witness that says there's uh, all these casings came from one place, all these. So argument can be made relying on the evidence uh, that there is a possibility of more than one shooter by looking at where the cartridges are, where the shells are, how they're distributed. That would be for the jury to decide whether or not the state proved that there was only one gun and one shooter, which is why they brought this witness up at the last moment. They knew that that was a problem. That's how it changes. If that witness isn't there at all, the argument can be made that, in fact, they did not prove the distribution of these shells in the house, out of the house, how many uh, uh, shots came out of that gun, all those things. Was it reloaded? Could it have been reloaded? All those things are not there for the state to stand up during closing and say, my witness said this, and, there, and therefore that's it. And I had no witness to bring in to uh, dispute that. And back to the refuted question, once it's refuted, uh, any trial attorney knows that a jury listens to expert witnesses more than they're supposed to. 
no matter how many jury instructions you give them that say they are not uh, anything more than an expert, you give them the, the, as much credence as you think an expert needs, they're going to say their expert said this, and we didn't have an expert. I couldn't bring, once refuted, you've got to go beyond that to say, hey, this is what can be and wasn't. Any other questions on that issue? Your Honor, I'd like to address, the next issue I wanted to address was issue 14. It's just in phase two, I believe, is referring to the jury instructions uh, and the, and the juror not, jury not following the jury instructions on mitigating uh, factors. The jury just didn't listen to the court's instructions on mitigating factors. They came back with a verdict recommending death, I believe, within two hours. Judge, uh, the trial court, in her sentencing order, found several mitigating factors existed. She did say she wasn't giving them uh, much evidence or any evidence at all, but she found they existed. This jury found that not a single solitary mitigating circumstance existed in any fashion. It's clear they didn't listen to the court's instructions on what a mitigating factor is and what a mitigating factor isn't and whether they should give it any weight. They gave none any weight. Judge, the trial court judge uh, gave some of them uh, weight. It's Mr. Joseph's position that they didn't care what the mitigating factors were, didn't listen to what the mitigating factors were. As a matter of fact, um, there are a couple issues which I talk about in my brief regarding heinous, atrocious, and cruel, and cold calculated, and premeditated where the judge let in uh, uh, irrelevant evidence and, and, and evidence about prior statements made by my client, which I believe also affected the jury's in instructions, but I believe those are clearly briefed and, and my position is, is in the brief on those. But they didn't listen to the court's instructions, and when the judge did her sentencing order, she did and she's found that there were mitigating factors. My position is, had the jury listened to the court's instruction, followed the court's instructions regarding the mitigating factors, and found that some existed, but they weren't giving them any weight, it could have changed one juror's uh, opinion. That's all you need to prevent a death sentence. Uh, so it, it, it's my position that they did not listen to the instructions, and this is shown by the fact that the judge in evaluating the same evidence found that there were mitigating factors. For those reasons, I believe that the uh, death sentence should be overturned. Counsel, you are in your rebuttal time. I understand. You can keep going. I understand. Your Honor, in just a few short minutes, uh, I have, I say I have eight minutes left. The only other thing I'd like to talk about is proportionality. Now, I know this court has said there is no proportionality. But at this point, I'd just like to give a nod to proportionality and ask the court to reconsider Judge LaBarca's dissenting opinion and do a proportionality review of this case. This is not one of the most heinous, atrocious, and cruel or cold and calculated uh, homicides that have occurred in the state of Florida. It's bad, but it isn't worth the death penalty. And I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Counsel? Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Rhonda Geiger on behalf of the state of Florida. I guess I'll just jump right into issue one um, and address some of counsel's comments with respect to that. Well, let, let me just ask, maybe start you off on issue one. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Geiger, uh, the, the murders in this case uh, occurred on, on December 28, 2017. Correct. Uh, the defendant was indicted uh, a month and a day later, uh, January 18th, 2018. Uh, this case went to jury selection, began uh, on February, right, and on February 23, two years and a little more than a month after the indictment, uh, the prosecutor comes in with the, uh, during jury selection, with an amended witness list, uh, providing them with an expert witness of all things. Now, if I'm reading the prosecutor's explanation to the judge during the Richardson inquiry as to why that happened, and she, like a good prosecutor, or he, uh, 
went to visit her, the detective, as anyone who's done homicide cases would know to do, and go over all the evidence, and they're going over the exhibits, and going over the casings, and going over everything. And at the end of the discussion on the casings, uh, the prosecutor asked, uh, where's my expert report on these casings, on the ballistics report? And the lead detective said, there isn't one because one wasn't done. Now, this is the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, uh, which has a humongous budget, and they have their own labs. They don't have to send it anywhere. So strings were pulled, and somehow the ballistics department got it done that day. And lo and behold, the next day there was a report. And that's when counsel got it. Is that pretty much the, the lowdown of what happened? I think maybe we're off by one day, but yes, that's pretty much. I think jury selection began on the 14th, and the report and the witness were disclosed on the 13th. But okay. yes, pretty much. Right, so that's pretty much what happened. Yes. And, and, and obviously, it was inadvertent. It wasn't anything intentional. It's just things happen. Uh, so tell me then, I mean, uh, how is it a, a ballistics report from an expert in, in is an important issue in a trial. And this case was completely circumstantial. No one testified they saw the defendant actually shoot the person. Am I correct? People well, heard the I, shots. I guess, I guess if you take mm -hmm. counsel's argument that the identification coming in through Detective Creelman was not substantive evidence, mm -hmm. then I would agree with you. But my argument is that that is substantive evidence. So yes, we do have two eyewitness shoot, eyewitnesses to the shooter. OK. so. Anyway, you had this, these casings uh, in there, and their theory of the case, you know, as maybe a long shot or not, uh, was that perhaps someone else was involved in the shooting. And again, that may be a long shot, but it yet is their theory of the case. How is it not prejudice for them to be, you know, struggling to go out there and find an expert to come in and testify while he's trying to pick a jury in a first degree murder case where the state's seeking the death penalty? Well, I think we have to cover a couple of issues first of all. So I, I think we know it was inadvertent. I don't think there's any dispute on that. Um, and the judge gave counsel every opportunity to explain that prejudice to him. Um, she gave him an opportunity to dispute what she said about her, whether what the defense was. And I think her exact words with respect to um, the his theory of the defense is, um, isn't, isn't it, it your defense? It wasn't my guy. One gun or five guns doesn't matter if your defense is it wasn't my guy. He didn't have a theory of his defense. So, and he was given every opportunity to say that. Um, yeah, my theory is there was another person there. My theory is um, alibi. He didn't do any of those things. And I think what we have to look at is whether or not his defense was equally as viable with the admission of this evidence as it was without this evidence. And the fact is, is it didn't change anything. His defense was still, it isn't my guy, no matter how many weapons there are. And even if he thinks he could have somehow shown, which I, I don't agree with his categorization of Omar Felix's testimony. Omar Felix flat out said, I would expect another expert to come to the same conclusion as I did with respect to these nine casings coming from the same firearm. So whether or not another expert would have said, or said the same thing or said something different, that doesn't in any way impact his defense. And I think another thing that we have to shift to slightly is that exclusion of evidence is not a, a, a favorable remedy. Exclusion of evidence is the last resort. And so if we're going to back up from that and say this was disclosed pre-trial, and I think if you look at the case law in general, when courts have found prejudice, and have said that the judge conducted the Richardson ruling incorrectly, it's when this evidence was disclosed after the trial started. So the defense has already committed to something. Uh, the, the state won't be offering any fingerprint or DNA evidence. Oh, shoot, we have that evidence. My, my, my question I have is here, I mean, typically the remedy when something like this happens right before trial, 
one remedy is to grant a continuance. Sure. And yes. we'll try this case six months from now. Mr. Susnick, you go out and hire he your expert. He was offered that. But the, the judge didn't deal with the Richardson inquiry until after the jury was sworn. So what are you going to do, send a, a 14, 15 people home for like three or four months and well, then bring them back? She did specifically discuss the timing um, throughout this. And I, I agree, it would have been ideal if they would have handled it at the very beginning. She, she took the continuance option off the table once the jury was sworn. Well, she took a lengthy continuance off the table, but again, she very specifically said, I will give you time to find someone. That is a quote. I will give you time to find someone. And I think this sort of plays into counsel's argument that there are no tool marks in Florida or anywhere. If there aren't any, no amount of time is going to give you a tool mark expert. So that becomes a little bit off the table as well. It's a little bit irrelevant. But Omar Felix is a firearms expert. He's not a tool mark expert. He specifically said that a tool mark expert is an umbrella term, a fire that will cover everything. Any tool that makes a mark on any object is a tool mark. So nobody's going to be just a tool mark expert. You have to narrow that down. You have to funnel that down to be, and so he's a firearms expert. So he knows how to identify the tool marks that come about with the use of a firearm. So, I mean, I think that's disputable as well, that he needed a tool mark expert. There's no such thing. You have to, you have to winnow that down. He needed a firearms expert, and there are many of those. So looking that twofold, if there aren't any tool mark experts, he's never going to find one. If he needed a firearms expert, there are plenty of those, and he, in fact, had one. Um, and he could have found another one. The trial court said, we will make accommodations. I mean, that, that is a quote. We will make accommodations for you. Um, and she said, I can't imagine you can't find one in two weeks. He had a two-week period to do so. So uh, all of that fails. He can't find one. It's incumbent upon them, hit on him at some point, to say, I need some time. She could have adjourned for five days. That happens. Trial courts take breaks, admonish the jurors not to do anything in the interest of fairness, but the fact of the matter here is the trial court held an appropriate Richardson hearing. She made the proper determinations. She came up with a remedy to that violation. She offered him time, and she also offered him the opportunity to show what the prejudice was, and he was unable to do that. And I, I really think you have to look at the fact that since the defense theory of defending himself is just as viable with this evidence as it was without the evidence, that it doesn't matter. It's, in the end, it, it didn't change anything for him. So, you know, I think looking at it that way, and you have to say, she fashioned a remedy. Um, he may not have liked it, but she gave him that opportunity. She said she'd give him time. She said she'd she authorized the expert. Um, he didn't ask for any more time when it came time for trial, and he did. Omar Felix testified, I think it was on a Friday. Um, he hadn't even begun his case yet. So, and again, I understand the trial, the, the, the timing, and he shouldn't be um, interviewing witnesses after trial. I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing that from the time this was disclosed until the time he would have had to present his case, he had, at that point, the judge determined he would have had about two weeks to get that, to, to make that happen. So um, because he didn't like her remedy doesn't mean that it's not appropriate. It just means he didn't like it. Did I answer your question? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, and, you know, I guess I, I would agree with counsel on one thing, that the jury should have all the evidence in front of them. Um, and again, remembering that exclusion of this is an absolute last resort. Exclusion of, of evidence is not looked upon favorably, um, especially when it's disclosed before the trial technically began. You know, admittedly, the Richardson hearing was conducted after the trial began, but the disclosure occurred the day before trial. So trial began on the 14th, the disclosure occurred on the 13th. He didn't ask for a continuance then either. Not saying it would have been granted, because I, you know, they obviously had the jury pretty much ready to go, but he didn't ask for a continuance. 
Um, and if, if, this was, if this was such a huge impact on his defense, surely he would have done so, and he did not. So I think looking at this from the standard of abuse of discretion, you have to say that the judge abused her discretion in fashioning this remedy and not excluding the evidence. And I just, I don't think it gets to that. I don't think it gets to that level. Moving, any questions on that? Or should I move to counsel's next issue? Moving to his next issue, which is um, issue number 14 about the jury not following the law. I think that that's, uh, that's presumptuous. We have no evidence other than they didn't find mitigators, that they didn't follow the law. And all the jury has to do is consider the mitigators, which they did. They, don't, they were presented, but the jury doesn't, isn't required to find them proven simply because the defense presented them. And when you look at the witness testimony and a lot of the witness testimony that came in through um, the family members that had already testified in the trial, and I think we can all glean a lot from the transcripts if, if you looked at those about the attitude and the demeanor of those witnesses at trial. Um, one, the judge went so far as to say that he had committed a fraud upon the court. These are the same witnesses that testified in mitigation. The jury found them to be essentially not credible um, with their testimony that they offered during trial. So the fact that they rejected that evidence in mitigation is that's, that's, their, that's their option. They can do that. Um, that's why the judge, who has a professional expert eye, that's, that's the safeguard, is she also sat there and reviewed it, and she did find mitigators. So the fact that the jury didn't find them really is harmless, and that's, that's within the purview of their determination. They're allowed to not find those if they don't find that they were properly presented. Um, it, that's what they get to do. That's their job. So absent him saying they didn't follow the rules, that just that claim without any proof, we just don't know. We don't know what they did. We have to presume they followed the rules. They were given those. They are presumed to follow the rules and the instruction given by the court. And the fact that he didn't prove the mitigators doesn't mean that they didn't do their job. So, I mean, honestly, I don't think that there's any, any evidence in the record that the jury did not did not. Uh, follow the rules with respect to with respect to the mitigators. I will throw this back to you. If you, anybody has any questions on the other thirteen issues, sure. Meditated aggravator. With respect to both victims, or both? Please. Yes. Okay. So looking, I think, at the evidence with respect to, I'll start with, um, I'll start with Collada. Um, we have to, was it not an emotional frenzy, panic, or fit of rage? And honestly, you could apply this to both Collada and Kyra. Um, you have to remember that he, the defendant, came home from work. Well, first, let's, let's back up just a little bit. I think we have to back up to the threat that came in um, that happened two days before Christmas uh, that Ms. Tarver testified that, um, that the defendant said, um, Kyra has one more chance to make me mad or bother Kamari. Um, and, you know, essentially, that she has one more chance. Well, so that, then on Christmas Day, somebody sees him with a weapon. So at some point, he's procured a weapon a gun. So we have a threat. Two days later, we have him obtaining a firearm. And then three days later, we have this incident. Um, moving to the day of the murders, the kids had had this little dispute earlier in the morning before lunch. There were text messages that went back and forth about that, text messages between, um, between Mr. Joseph and Collada, the ultimate victim phone calls, conversations between Collada and Ms. Denson about what had happened. Um, there's evidence that he was, he, the appellant, uh, Mr. Joseph, was uh, got into an altercation, a verbal altercation with his mom about this. So all of these things leading up to it, we have, first of all, we have, a, first of all, we have previous incidents between the kids. 
we have a threat that if it happens again, something's going to happen. She has one more chance to she has one more chance to do something to Kamari. We have him obtaining a weapon. We have him arriving home from work that day, knowing that this incident has occurred. The, one, the, the thing that he said, you have one more chance, it has happened. He goes into his bedroom. He has time to reflect. He has time to contemplate this. The, his mother says he was reading the Bible. But no matter what, he's in his bedroom. And he gets his weapon, and he confronts Kalada about this incident between their two kids. We know that this happened, so we know that he planned this. Um, we know it wasn't a rage, we know it wasn't a frenzy for a lot of reasons. First of all, he shot her five times, and we know she lived through at least one of those shots, but most likely the first four, she, as, because she was crying for help. Um, he could have stopped. He could have stopped right then. Um, he didn't have to continue, but he, he did. He ultimately fired the fatal shot with her. So there's definitely not a panic or fit of rage. This was very, very calculated. And I think we can look at it that it had to be calculated also because there were nine people in that house, and the only two that were injured were the ones that were the object of his aggression, the object of his, um, his attention. And there was no immediate provocation there. When he confronted Kalata, he was armed. He had that gun. So it's not like he went up to her and said, hey, can we talk about the kids? He went up to her and confronted her with a weapon. And when that discussion continued on, he shot her. So you have a, a much stronger heightened premeditation argument for the child because he chased after her, I, I, followed her outside and so on. So that's not a problem. But the first one, it seems like there was an argument and all of a sudden he started shooting. Well, and I think, I think that it was referenced as an argument, but I think at best you can call it a confrontation. What we know is that Kalata had sort of stayed away. She was in her bedroom, um, and she was doing laundry. She was kind of away from the whole family activity, and we know she didn't have a gun. So obviously when there was this confrontation, and I, and I think that that, that means something because Kalata didn't initiate this. We know that when there was this confrontation, he brought a gun to that fight. Um, and he was the one that was mad. She wasn't. So I, I think maybe calling it an argument, it, 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 maybe it doesn't matter. But he went looking for that with her. But I think the big thing is, is that he could have stopped. Um, it was, it, it, he made his intentions clear. Um, he calculated this from the beginning. He said, I'm going to do something. This happens one more time, and it happened one more time. Moving to Kyra, which I, I agree with you, um, you know, in order to get out of this house, she had to run by, she had to run by this incident. She had to know what was happening. And, you know, I think this is, this is a, big, a big point, too, is as he's chasing her down, his brother tackles him. So he's tackled, he maintains his firearm. He doesn't hurt his brother, he doesn't shoot his brother. Um, nobody else gets injured in this fracas where the brother's trying to save Kyra. But what he does do is get up, extricate himself from this, keep his weapon, and continue to hunt her down. So he had every opportunity to stop. He had every opportunity to say, I just got tackled, what am I doing? But he didn't because he was on a mission. Um, he had said, I'm going to do this. If this happens, this happened, and he did what he promised. So, I mean, I think that, I think that, I know shooting deaths often are not, you know, looked at this way, but it's, he, he, he promised what he was going to do, and he did it. The trouble I have with just that, that summation of the argument is that the same could be said of our decision in Richardson versus state in 1992 and others where some of the facts you've put together, an argument, obtaining a firearm, a confrontation, we've held do not alone get us to a cold calculated and premeditated showing. Now I agree you've said more than the summation and what you've said in addition to the summation I think does some of the lifting for you. Um, but I guess my, my, the question I'm still left with is, 
um, can you can you identify what specifically takes us beyond just finding a gun, having a dispute with someone, and using it? Because I think that rule does prove too much. Well, he didn't he didn't have a dispute first of all with Kalata. Remember, his issue was with the children. So, you know, I he he armed himself in advance. We know that. We know he got this weapon days before. So he, uh, he had advanced proc procurement of this firearm. There was no resistance from the victims, none. They, for everything we know, were just innocent people in their own home. We have uh, no provocation from either victim, clearly. We all know that. Um, it was essentially an execution-style killing. There was no... There was no real emotion involved in this. So, I mean, I think, especially as it was pointed out, moving to Kyra, it, it doesn't seem like it could be any more planned out with her. And so, you know, she, because she was the object of this threat. She was the reason that this threat came about. But I think that that time frame makes it advanced premeditation that time frame from the 23rd where he makes this threat and then the 25th where we know he has a weapon and then on the 28th he makes sure he has this weapon when he initiates this confrontation um, with Kalata who did nothing other than beg for her life I just I and even you know what even if we take it away with Kalata even if we take it away with her we still have eight other aggravators so I mean, in the big picture, it doesn't really change anything. I mean, that would be my argument. Right. I mean, of, of course, we, we have to, you know, make sure that we adopt the right rule with respect right. to each aggregator. So, um, you know, I just want to make sure I understand the yes. state's argument. I think I do. Well, and I mean, I would, I, I would look at Campbell where it, the, you know, that spe specifically says advanced pr procurement of the weapon, lack of resistance or prov provocation of the victims. Um, uh, killing, execution style killing. Um, it's, you know, it tracks those facts here where, you know, we know that he made a promise. If this happens, I, something, you know, she has one more chance and, and he kept that promise. So this aggravator seems like it's the one that most consistently in our cases, to me at least, is kind of debatable. Um, yeah, I agree. What do you consider sort of the core of what this aggravator is getting at? Well, I think looking at, uh, I, I mean, we know it has to be heightened premeditation, not just premeditation. Um, but I think that, I think. The cold, look, it's the cold, I mean, you know, it's the cold. It's unclear sort of what work these different words are doing, you know, cold, calculated. I mean, the, you know, the baseline for what you need for premeditation is so low that it just seems like we constantly in our cases kind of struggle well, to give to, to make this a true aggravator sure and there's crossover too obviously some of the facts are going to apply to all three of them um you know it, it, is it cold if somebody's lying there begging for if somebody you live with somebody who's invited you into their home is lying there begging for their life yeah i would say that's cold hunting down an 11 year old child i would say that's cold so I mean, I think the bigger one here is if you accept that the five days is premeditation. And I think, you know, I, 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 think, I think it is. I guess it's the five day. I guess the, what arguably makes it trickier is that you did have this kind of, art, you know, it seems mm -hmm. trivial, obviously, to someone sure. who wasn't involved. But you did have this provocation. It wasn't, it wasn't like you had a, you know, on day one, there's a plan to kill and then you sit there and wait and carry it out five days later. I mean, there was this incident that occurred. And I mean, it, it's at the end of the day, I think, as Justice Coriel was saying, that the relevance in this case for us is more just kind of articulating the rule. I mean, it's, it's not something that would, you know, have a material effect on the outcome here. Right. But. Well, I mean, if we look at just general premeditation, we all know that can happen just an instant before the crime is committed. So this premeditation even if it was hours before it's still advanced i mean you know, which i guess though but that gets to the whole issue of what aggravators are for i mean if they're if the point of the aggravators in the context of the overall death penalty scheme is to kind of separate you know the worst murders from 
it's, it seems it's horrible to even talk about murders as being more, you know what I'm yes, saying? I do know, yes. But so just barely, you know, getting over the sort of minimal baseline for premeditation, it's, it, as a matter of semantics, obviously I know that it might do that, but whether it satisfies what an aggravator is supposed to do is kind of a separate question. Well, I think that when you have this kind of premeditation directed at an 11-year-old child, um, I think it gets over right. it. And, and then obviously you've got the HAC here too, which, yes. you know, relates to that. Yes. So. And, I, and again, that's why I pointed out there, are, even if you take it away with the first victim with Collada, you still have eight others to fall back on. But, you know, my argument remains exactly the same, that it, it, it satisfies both of those, heinous, atrocious, cruel, and um, cold, calculated, and premeditated. Any other questions you'd like me to address? Any of the other 13 issues? No? The state then respectfully requests that this court um, uphold the appellant's judgments and sentences from the lower court. Thank you. Rebuttal. Yes, Your Honor. I'd like to address just a, 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 a few things. Uh, the last one that, well, we had eight other aggravators. Let's not worry about the... Uh, the, the, the one that we should have never instructed the jury on and the jury heard instructions uh, that made the defendant out to be something worse than he was. So that's why you don't give jury instructions to jurors that don't pertain to the case. That's why you have a, 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 uh, uh, an instruction conference and I'll stick with all my, uh, I'll rest on the brief and the rest of that, but the argument that no, it, 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 it's okay because we have all the other stuff uh, it, it taints the jury. No, but I mean, counsel, to be fair, she made a pretty compelling argument about why it would satisfy the test. And she's obviously just sort of saying, as anyone would, that even if, if the court disagreed with her, that it, you know, that it wouldn't have affected the outcome. But I mean, do you want to respond to what she said about, you know? My position is we don't know if it would affect the outcome of the. No, but can you respond to why the cold calculated and premeditated wasn't met given, given the factors that she just discussed? I, I believe it was improperly given and, and I would rest on what I said in my brief regarding that, Your Honor. Um, and as to the gun, we know little or nothing about the gun. Uh, the, the time frame that the state has laid out, I don't believe is backed up by the uh, record. The gun was never recovered. We don't know where the gun came from. We don't know where the gun went. Uh, so I, 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 I would say that plays against her argument that this was all a premeditation. And as to the statement that was made two days earlier by an adult to a child that you have one more chance, he didn't say, I'm gonna kill you. You need to do this, you need to do that. Any adult who said to a child, you got one more chance or you need to behave, that statement should never have come in. It was irrelevant to this case, and I'll rest on my brief as to why it was irrelevant, but it should have never come in to this case. Excuse me for removing my glasses. I can't see both. Um, A, a review of this whole transcript, it, it, it makes it clear that the trial judge was moving on with this trial. She didn't say she was going to uh, slow it down for me to go find an expert. Uh, she didn't say that, uh, she did say I could use their expert. Uh, I never said there were no experts that were available. There were no experts that I could find at that point. I was court appointed to this case, which meant I have to go by the JAC. As Judge Labarga pointed out, the sheriff's office, on the other hand, has this budget and they can do whatever they want. I have to get permission. I have to find a witness. I have to find a witness who's willing to do it under the cost of the JAC. Uh, so, no, this wasn't just a, hey, he could go in two weeks and find somebody. There was no witnesses available under the time frame that the judge put in uh, place here. It was real clear the judge, the trial judge was moving along with this trial. And the last thing I'd uh, address is the state keeps saying um, that exclusion is the, is the least remedy we should do. Exclusion is frowned upon. We should never do exclusion. 
Well, that's what the state knows the law is. So if the state knows that's what the law is and you present a witness at the last minute knowing that the court's not going to exclude the witness, it gives the state a benefit for knowing that the witness isn't going to be excluded. As Judge LaBarga pointed out, this Richardson hearing took place after the jury had been sworn. This witness should have been excluded. It was compounded the error by not permitting a full examination of his testimony by the judge on her own motion, cutting it off. This was not harmless error. The court should overturn this conviction, overturn the, life sent the death sentence, and return this for a retrial. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you for your time and attention. We thank you both for your arguments in this case today. The court will now move to the second case on today's docket, Jackson versus the State of Florida. Good morning. May I reserve five minutes, please? Certainly. May it please the court. I'm Karen Moore, and Thomas Rosick and I represent Kim Jackson. We're here today to discuss the guilt phase issues um, raised in the appeal after the circuit court's denial of our motion for post-conviction relief. The circuit court found deficient conduct by trial counsel on the handling of the DNA evidence in this murder trial. However, the court did not find that the prejudice rose to the uh, requirement by Strickland. The circuit court misapprehended our argument on this, and I'd like to, to talk about uh, the DNA evidence and other issues in the case. Um, the case consisted of a hair found on the victim's leg that was determined to be a full marker DNA uh, match with Mr. Jackson, a fingerprint and blood on the lip of the sink, and his denial of ever having been in the house or known uh, the victim as Pierce. The hair on the victim's leg, um, the defense tried to argue that it was innocently transferred. Um, and in JOA, um, they argued that it could have been uh, coming through an open door, people passing by. Um, it, it could have happened in innocent ways. The circuit court said, give me a reasonable reason. If counsel had retained a DNA expert in a timely manner, instead of about five weeks out from trial, and had counsel met with the DNA expert, had her examine all the evidence in the case, had her available at trial, the DNA expert could have explained that hair has such a low priority level in testing in the DNA labs because it is so easily transferred. And the DNA expert could have explained to the, the court, and most importantly, the jury, that the hair could have been there quite innocently. Counsel, and, uh, the counsel can I, um, I'm going to ask a question about that. Sure. It's my understanding, kind of looking back at the, the transcript of that hearing, that your experts in the post-conviction phase did not refute um, any sort of claim from the original trial regarding the 34 nanograms that was on that hair. So is there any point that I missed or anything in the transcript in which your experts said naturally shed hair can result in this many nanograms of, of you know, evident DNA being in a hair versus something that's not naturally shed? Um, my expert said that she had obtained a full marker profile from a naturally shed hair. And the DNA analyst said she had, I believe, between 30 and 35 nanograms in the sample from this hair. 
Um, my expert also said that at the time of the testing, um, uh, the study was done in 2001, which council wasn't aware of, um, but at the 2006, when this testing was done, a full marker profile could be obtained from a single nanogram. And a nanogram is a billionth of a gram, so we're talking about incredibly minute, not visible to the, the, the naked eye uh, evidence here. So she's talking, uh, Ms. Clark is talking about 30 to 35, and my expert is talking about um, 1 to 10 nanograms. So in the scheme of things, we're talking about a difference of uh, 20 billionths of a gram, and it's not much. But the whole point of this is, and we didn't argue that this wasn't Kim Jackson's hair. Mr. Jackson had testified that he'd been in the house, he'd moved a couch, um, and he'd been up under the sink uh, repairing a, uh, the garbage disposal. So what the argument was, that this hair could have been there and easily transferred, but the circuit court did not accept that argument and, and, and was rather dismissive of the argument by uh, counsel at JOA. So we, we didn't argue it wasn't his hair. We were saying that it could have been naturally shed based on our expert's own experience um, and, and based on the fact that you could get a full marker profile from a single nanogram, a single, uh, you know, uh, billionth of a gram. Did your, did your expert say that that hair with that, with the 34 nanograms could have been naturally shed? Yes, she did. She did. Um, and, but, but the hair isn't the, the worst part of this. Um, the worst part of this is, well, there's another hair that that's bad, but, but the worst part is, is that the state um, put on uh, Detective Waldrop in, in rebuttal um, to state that the victim's van was found on the same road where the defendant lived about a mile or a mile and a half down. Um, and in closing, the state argued, um, well, you know, um, there's the van, the victim's van, there's her blood, there's a mixture there. Um, the DNA analyst says that, that um, the defendant matches at a couple of those markers. Um, and, and the point was to put the van close to the defendant's home. Um, Chester Nardvell, the friend of the victim who found her body but had noticed her car gone a couple of days before, um, uh, that was important um, because the state argued that the van went missing at, her time, at the time of the murder and they connected Mr. Jackson to the van with this evidence of he cannot be excluded. However, the report that was vetted by FDLE, by a, uh, another examiner and a technical examiner, and Ms. Clark had testified that every, wrote, every word she wrote, every test she did was, was reviewed. Um, the problem is that she said, I could not determine the profile of the minor donor. Had counsel had a DNA expert there, uh, the DNA expert could have explained to counsel, look, she's just testified beyond her report, and not only that, and the two experts we, we called were both former FDLE examiners, and they have guidelines, and they cannot include an allele or a peak that's below a threshold. They can exclude for that because the power is exclusion, but they cannot include, and when she said, I cannot exclude Mr. Jackson at the Y marker, or at two others, which came up on cross and then on redirect, she was saying, I can include him. And that was very critical evidence for the state because the state wanted to put Mr. Jackson in that van. The state had a problem. There was a, a, a third hair that was found in the victim's hand. They bagged her hands at the scene to preserve evidence. There was a third hair that had an extra allele Major donor, again, was, was, was Ms. Pierce, but there was a, a minor donor, an allele, that did not match Mr. Jackson. Add that to the fact that the DNA on the tip of the knife that Ms. Pierce wielded had DNA from at least one male, maybe two, that Mr. Jackson was excluded from. And then you've got a real reasonable doubt argument. And the problem is, is counsel did not even talk to the DNA expert they retained until the, the day before trial when she had not even completed her examination. They had no intention of calling her at trial. They were just checking a box. I talked to the DNA expert. She couldn't help. So it, it was 
deficient conduct, the court found that, but it was also very, very harmful because the defense could have rebutted the DNA expert's testimony that this was, you know, Jackson's DNA in the van that was stolen the night she was murdered and found near his home, and, and also excluded him because Ms. Zulegger, our expert, said, look, you can go below the threshold to exclude if you believe that it's a peak, if it's, if it's, if it's a peak. And um, Ms. Zulegger um, excluded Mr. Jackson at the VWA marker and I think one other. So this was important, it, it, and it could have cast doubt on her other testimony, too, frankly. Um, and, and it's concerning, again, I mean, she didn't do other things. She didn't um, run the, the second required test by CODIS of, of the co-filer. Um, she said she'd followed all the rules, but she didn't. So, you know, it, it could have cast doubt on, doubt on the fact that this was a, a forcefully shed hair, um, had the DNA expert been available had they utilized this expert. And when I asked Mr. Bate at the evidentiary hearing, um, you know, could a DNA expert have helped explain to you the ease of transfer of hair or the low value of testing hair at a crime scene? He said, well, I don't know um, if she knew about it. He obviously didn't know about it. So, um, you know, the, the court and the state argue, well, you know, it's, it's not, uh, w w we'll excuse this because um, you know, maybe he didn't want to bring up something on, on Cross when, when they were getting some good information from her. Um, but they didn't even know about it. So that can't be a valid strategy call. They didn't know about that. So the DNA um, w w was huge. And the DNA evidence is, is, is very daunting. You have to study it. Um, in this case, um, the first defense team requested the... the um, lab notes, you know, something beyond the, the, the mere report, um, the electronic data in, in January of 2010, and it was ordered disclosed um, in January of 2010. Um, when Mr. Bate hired this expert, um, he sent her the latent print reports two different times, um, and it wasn't until April 4th, and we're 11 days out from trial, when he finally gets the, the, the records that um, his expert had, had requested. Um, and his expert said, you know, again, it was wrong for um, Ms. Clark to testify below the threshold to include uh, Mr. Jackson in the blood on the steering wheel cover. Um, let me talk about the, the alibi, too. Um, because the jury came back with a question about the alibi. I'm sorry. I, uh, you, um, I was going to ask you about the other fingerprint, the fingerprint sure. on the sink. You can do alibi first, or since we're on the subject of fingerprints, would you like to do that? I, I can talk about the fingerprint. Okay. Let me, let me hear what you have to say uh, about issue uh, two, please. The fingerprint. A couple of things. The... Defense counsel opens in his opening statement and says, look, you're going to hear that this fingerprint is not of value for comparison purposes. And in the literal next breath says, but it's her fingerprint. Then he calls the witness in his case. And again, he has her testify that the print is not of value for comparison purposes. On cross-examination, that witness becomes another state witness because the state asks the witness to look at the side-by-side -side photos that have been enhanced since she last viewed them, and now she cannot exclude Mr. Jackson from that. The state put it best in closing that it was the most wildly confusing thing. Was it not of value or was it his print? Um, and uh, other bad evidence came from that. Um, the, the state then uh, did the reverse vouching, um, said, I know this examiner, and she's a great woman, but she's just dead wrong on this, and intimated that, she, that he had you know, information outside the record about her and why she shouldn't be believed. And, and the, this court had a problem with that on the direct appeal. Um, and, and, and the fact that the print is there, um, Mr. Jackson admitted being in the home. His print was there. I, I'm not contesting that it wasn't his print, but it doesn't mean that he killed this woman. 
You know, there's more proof that the DNA from the unknown people on the business end of the victim's knife killed her than anything else. So, the counsel, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just a fingerprint. It was correct? a fingerprint and blood. Right. And wasn't there, I mean, there was testimony that that, had, that is not just, blood doesn't just appear on fingerprints. It's usually made, made well, with the bloody fingerprint. <laughs> The Blood FBI. On the finger. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, that's okay. Go ahead. The FBI agent said she'd never seen it, but it was possible. But it, it, it could be that Mr. Jackson was at the scene at some other time, even after, and touched that. But it doesn't mean that he killed her. It does not mean that. And there's more evidence. The third allele of the of the, you know, the state described a violent struggle with 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 pulling and uh, there's a hair in her hand that has an allele that's not hers and it's not Mr. Jackson's. Same thing with the knife that she wielded. So it was important. Um, and uh, the, defense, uh, the defense was so disjointed it, 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 it argued contradictory theories on that. And it was confusing and, and Mr. Mizrahi put it best. It was wildly confusing. Let me go to the alibi. The jury came back with a question and counsel had advised their witnesses not to tell the jury that the reason they believed that this was Mr. Jackson's um, you know, weekend up about his birthday was because that was the last birthday they saw him as a free man. So at that point in time, the murder occurred in 2004 and the trial is in an April. So th this alibi is already nine years old and it's very stale. And these witnesses, um, friends, um, family, were predictably uh, impeached with their affection for Mr. Jackson and their uncertainty about the time. But if counsel had spent any time with Penny Williams, they would have learned that Ms. Williams, Mr. Jackson's sister, had very unique personal reasons to remember this date. Shortly after her brother left from his birthday celebration, in Adel, Georgia. She lost her job. She had three kids. Um, and it was the first Christmas she had not been able to provide gifts for them. She was embarrassed that she had to ask her father for, for help for gifts. She also met her future husband a couple of months later in February of 2005. And she married him in April of 2005. And those are dates that she knows. They are very unique to her and very personal to her and to her husband. Um, and that was never developed. So you have this very vague recollection of something that happened nine years earlier around his birthday. The other problem with the alibi uh, testimony provided was that Deborah Jackson, Kim Jackson's wife, testified. And first question on cross-examination is, have you ever been convicted of a crime involving dishonesty? And she said yes. At the evidentiary hearing, I asked um, Mr. Perkins, who conducted the direct on her, I said, why didn't you get up there and explain the circumstances behind this worthless check? And he said, well, I could have. He had no reason. There was no reason not to do that. Um, so there's no valid strategy call there. But he could have put her, or, or, conducted a redirect examination and asked her what happened with this check. It was a single check for about $50. Um, it was 20 years before her testimony. Um, and she Counsel, was, I just want you to be aware you are consuming your rebuttal time here. Um, anyway, she was a compelling witness. She could have explained that she had um, just missed this. Um, she'd lost a child. And the jury had very much interest in that alibi defense. They were considering it. They wanted to know about it, and they wanted that testimony read again. I'll reserve the remainder of my rebuttal time. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Jason Rodriguez, Assistant Attorney General for the State of Florida. In my time before the court, I'll explain why the post-conviction court correctly denied 
Jackson's 3851 initial motion on his guilt phase. Before reaching the substance of anything, I did want to address Justice Grosshan's question to opposing counsel early on regarding the 34 nanograms of DNA. And at no point in the evidentiary hearing below did any testimony come out that a naturally shed hair could contain 34 nanograms of DNA. The testimony was that 1 to 10 nanograms could come from a naturally shed hair. That was from their expert, and Ms. Clark agreed. If this court is more interested in that issue, the record sites for that are pages 2,391 through 98. I believe that's their expert testifying. Then regarding the 34 being beyond what a naturally shed hair would have contained, record at page 2,446, 2,489, and 2,519 through 21. There was no dispute that a naturally shed hair could not contain that amount of DNA. If it was naturally shed, it had 1 to 10 nanograms, and Ms. Clark says that's on the high end. 34 nanograms is not in that range. Regarding the, the remainder of the arguments that were presented here, I did want to focus the court on two legal principles at the outset. And the first one, I think, is probably best put by the 11th Circuit case of Putman versus Head, cited in the briefs, and that's that if the record is unclear or incomplete about why counsel took the actions he took, that's when the presumption of competence attaches. And the 11th Circuit went on to say that the presumption afforded to counsel is not what a particular defense counsel in reality focused on and then deliberately decided or not to do or not do. Rather, the presumption is that what the particular defense lawyer did at trial, for example, what witnesses he presented or did not present, were acts that some reasonable lawyer might do. That's why, when it is unclear why counsel took the action he did below, counsel says a couple times, I don't remember why I didn't redirect Deborah Jackson. I don't remember why I didn't bring this out from Penny Williams. This court is required to under the Sixth Amendment and under Strickland to indulge in a presumption of competence. Could a reasonable lawyer take that action as strategy? And if they could, that's the end of the inquiry. The second- What, what, what about the evidence that there was DNA from two other people on the tip of the knife? Well, Your Honor, that was actually brought out by counsel. On the, as far as the pocket knife that was found beneath Jackson, that, or sorry, my apologies, the victim, that pocket knife was found beneath her and that was the evidence that Jackson's trial counsel argued and said that was the best evidence I could hope for. The state's expert is telling me that there is DNA that matches neither Jackson nor the victim found on a pocket knife beneath and, her. And was that used extensively in closing? Yes, Your Honor. Jackson's counsel argued that this was the person that did it and said maybe it was the people that came in afterwards that were looting the house. But yes, that was argued in closing. That was Jackson's theory of the case. That so what, what would you consider to be the, the best evidence there is to support this, the state's that, uh, position that this defendant did it? The bloody fingerprint. Because particularly, and this court noted on direct appeal as it recited the facts that although the FBI experts said that she'd never seen it, but it was possible that I believe it was William Shade <coughs> included the sink fingerprint print matched the ring finger of Jackson and the fingerprint was left on the sink while Jackson's finger was coated in a wet substance such as blood. This is not a situation where he was there a couple of months before and left a fingerprint that was later coated in blood. It was a situation where he touched that sink while his, fingerprint, while his finger was coated in blood. So that ties him specifically to the murder. Obviously that goes in tandem with his denial that he ever knew her that the jury heard. Um, and that he'd ever been in her house, which is the first thing that he told investigators when they went to speak with him. The second principle that I do want to direct this court to is that a 3850 motion really confines what we discuss, both at the trial court and on appeal. And Penny Williams' name is not mentioned in the 3851 motion. It's not mentioned, her testimony is not mentioned in the 3851 motion. And so there can be no claim that is properly presented to this court regarding what she said or did not say. This court is bound and has recognized on multiple occasions, if it's not in the 3851 motion, we don't consider it. So with those claims in mind, I did want to proceed more directly, or those, those principles in mind, to talk about the specific issues in this case. The first being the blood on the steering wheel, and this misperception or mistaken statement that by saying that there's, there's potential male DNA there, um, that Clark testified she could include him. Clark's testimony was very clear that the results of her testing regarding the, the minor donor on the 
on the, with the DNA on the steering wheel was inconclusive, and the trial court recognized that. And to the extent that Clark even hinted the state, that I can include him, the state didn't recognize it because in closing, the state said, Clark can't even say if it's male or not. So there was no remote indication in Clark's testimony that she could include Jackson by her statements. She was firm all throughout. That is an inconclusive piece of DNA. I cannot utilize it to include or exclude. Um, and Clark also mentioned that the modern way that FDLE has shifted and the testing has shifted is that we don't use what's noted as the star ones where we exclude for something a lower threshold than we would, than we would include. So it's the same analysis on both fronts under the current time. Regarding the allele that their expert below Zilliger used to exclude him, Clark testified it was in the stutter position. I wouldn't have used it. And so we had a situation where what counsel would have found would have been disputed evidence, whether he could be excluded or whether the results of the blood on the, DNA, or on the <coughs> steering wheel were inconclusive. And that's important because counsel had a specifically articulated strategy in the record on pages 2,312 through 15. And that strategy was, I'm not going to attack what Clark does as far as her testing because she has given me the best piece of information that I could have, someone else's DNA on that pocket knife. So to the extent that in post-conviction, Jackson is claiming counsel should have done all of these other steps that would have directly gone against the strategy and the reasonable strategy that he had, his ineffective assistance of counsel claim fails. Regarding the ease of hair transference, this court has thoroughly rejected that in Reed versus State. It bears really no greater um, mention than that. Um, the other DNA piece of evidence was what was termed incorrect testimony from Clark regarding the hair that matched neither Jackson or the vic victim according to post-conviction counsel. Clark talked about this hair. There were 10 hairs apparently found in the victim's hand. All of them matched the victim except for one. That's undisputed. There is one that is a disputed hair that contains a singular allele that their expert said below matches neither Jackson nor the victim, and so the postulation is that belonged to some other party. The issue was, again, this would have been disputed at trial. Uh, Clark, in her testimony, said this allele is a Semitic point mutation. It's not an uncommon occurrence. And all of the other hairs, they looked alike. There was no way to distinguish them. So in reviewing everything, I labeled this as inconclusive because I know about this phenomenon, and that's what I would have told to the jury. So we again have a situation where Counsel could have gone against his strategy, created a battle of the experts on this hair, or he could have done the more reasonable thing that he did do, which is focus on the pocket knife beneath the victim that had DNA that no one disputed belonged to someone other than Jackson or the victim. I did want to very briefly on, on this issue, the trial court made a very generalized finding of deficient performance that seemed to be based on a frustration with defense counsel that they did not contact a DNA expert sooner. But this court owes the trial court no deference when it comes to a determination of deficient performance. That is reviewed de novo. The underlying facts are for competent substantial evidence. And there is no Sixth Amendment time frame that requires a defense counsel, any defense counsel, to contact a witness within a given point of time. And that appears to be what the trial court's frustration was. Counsel did indeed contact a defense witness on the eve of trial, gave her uh, the evidence that was needed incorrectly gave her the evidence on one occasion, but her ending result was, I found one piece of important evidence, DNA on the pocket knife, the counsel already knew about. So counsel didn't deficiently perform by, in fact, consulting an expert, a DNA expert who was of no help to him regarding any of his strategy and told him what he already knew. There is no Sixth Amendment clock that suddenly stops and requires counsel to perform things in a certain way and there is nothing beyond that. Regarding the, the fingerprints, um, there is a claim raised that there were contradictory claims about the print they presented. Royal, as the fingerprint examiner, who said the print is of no value, but also conceded both in opening and closing that uh, this print belonged to Jackson. The trial court explicitly found a variation of this claim was waived below because it was not raised in the 3851, it was raised for the first time in closing argument. And I say a variant because the argument that was raised there is that counsel was ineffective for presenting Royal and then conceding in closing argument that 
it was, in fact, Jackson's fingerprint. It is morphed now on appeal to counsel was ineffective because presented Royal and now in opening and closing, it was uh, conceded that it was his print. This court does not permit claims to morph mid-appellate process or for them to be presented for the first time in closing argument. Um, the failure to object to the state's comments about Royal in closing counsel had an answer for that, and the court found that that was a reasonable strategic decision because counsel was okay with the state partially vouching for a defense witness. That's the bottom line. Counsel had a very unusual situation with this fingerprint expert. This appears to have been the only fingerprint expert that came to the conclusion that the print was of no value. Counsel had consulted with a fingerprint expert, and in post-conviction it came out that individual was of no help to him. So counsel had this piece of evidence that was contradicted by a lot of other evidence. It makes sense for counsel to not put his credibility behind this singular witness that would have contradicted the FBI, the state's other examiner, um, but at the same time a having a desire to just place that before the jury and see what happens. See if maybe one juror thinks that that's reasonable doubt without putting his credibility at issue before the entirety of the panel. That appears to be what counsel did in this case. Um, I can't give you counsel's exact reasoning because since it wasn't presented in 3851, it wasn't delved into at the evidentiary hearing either. Um, so this really ends up looking more like an ineffective, ineffective assistance of counsel claim on the face of the record than anything else. That particular one does. Um, let's see. Regarding uh, the investigate, investigative alibi situation, again, the trial court seemed to have a general frustration that counsel did not go and consult these alibi witnesses at a better time frame. That's simply not the standard for ineffective assistance of counsel. The Williams claim we've already partially discussed is not referenced at all in the 3851 motion, and it is improper to go and discuss it beyond that. Uh, it's a waived claim if it's not raised, and at minimum, as this court noted recently in Brown, when you have a failure to call witness claim, you have to name the witness and what they would have said. And that's citing Booker, which is a much older case. Could I, could I ask you to go back to the alibi, uh, which, which you pretty quickly threw? Um, does the state uh, have a position on whether there could have been any strategic basis for not conducting the alibi investigation in a more timely fashion? So counsel's, counsel gave a reason to that below. He said, I knew the alibi was stale by now, that it was an old defense, and so it was a low priority, was in a nutshell what I took his, his reason to be. Um, but he did send investigators out. He did, in fact, present a fairly comprehensive alibi defense. If his alibi witnesses were believed, they placed Jackson in, uh, in Georgia from October 15th to October 22nd. The murder occurred on October 17th, so it would have been midway in between those two dates. So it's difficult to determine how counsel could have presented or investigated an ineffective alibi defense when he actually presented a decent alibi defense that simply couldn't overcome the fact that Jackson had touched the sink above the body of the victim with his finger while it was coated in blood and left a mark behind him. Um, so that appears to be the strategic reason. I have other things to do. I don't have the time to deal with this old alibi defense, but I will do it. And it, he did, in fact, investigate it and put on a substantial alibi defense. Regarding the, the failure to prepare the wife to testify, um, it's unclear what counsel could have done as far as the um, Delving into more of the details of this, he could have brought out the facts that post-conviction counsel suggests, but that's a normal strategic reason. The trial court pointed out that it's strategic not to point the jury more closely to the fact that this individual has a misdemeanor conviction. And I do want to hone in that if counsel would have presented exactly what the witness said below, Deborah Jackson said below, it was a 20-year-old conviction and I just missed it. Well, she didn't just miss it. We don't convict people for just missing checks. The statute that has been in play since the time period that she's referenced requires a mens rea of intentionality. So if she verbatim said what she said in post-conviction, the state's next step would be to admit a certified copy of the conviction and discuss what it would have been required to prove to get that conviction, including that she intentionally lied about her checks. 
And if she was willing to lie about that, wouldn't she be willing to lie to save her husband's life? Get him off on a first-degree murder charge. That would have been the picture the state could have depicted if she testified exactly the way that she did in post-conviction. And that's simply a reasonable strategy uh, for counsel to avoid delving into things of that nature. Uh, I did miss on the issue four, the investigate the alibi defense, uh, the last birthday before prison. In my review, that's also unpreserved, but it also makes perfectly reasonable sense why counsel would not have wanted the jury to know that Jackson was going to prison right after this time period where the state's accusing him of first degree murder. That's very different than learning that he's a convicted felon at some unspecified point in the past. Um, learning that you are at this point in time admittedly committing crimes that are putting you away for a long period of time while the state's accusing you of first degree murder is just vastly different. And at minimum, a reasonable counsel could have perceived it that way, and this counsel, to counsel, in fact, did perceive it that way. Uh, Your Honors, as Justice Coriel reminded me last time, I need to invite the court to, uh, if they have any more questions before sitting down, and so if the court has any more questions, I'm more than happy to address those at this point. Seeing none, the state respectfully asks that this court affirm uh, the conviction that has been entered in this case. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. Had counsel presented a full alibi defense, the witness's testimony would have been boosted, their credibility would have been boosted, and this likely would have been a different result. The offer of strategy for not uh, talking to Deborah Jackson or not doing the redirect can't be provided um, at the evidentiary hearing or in the court's order denying um, by the court or by the state when counsel didn't even consider it at the material time, and that was at trial. Um, Strickland says that we can't look at these cases through the distorting lens of hindsight. Well, neither should the state be able to provide strategy reasons for counsel who did not even consider this evidence at the time of trial. And I'm talking about Clark now, Lee Clark now. Um, the, the state suggested that, hey, maybe you didn't cross-examine Ms. Clark because she gave you helpful information. Well, that's not why he didn't cross-examine on the, the mixture on the, the steering wheel cover. He didn't know that she was testifying beyond her report, and he didn't know to contest that. And the state can't now provide a valid strategy reason for that. And just one more thing on the hair. Um, the lab report, and it's in evidence, I think it's on page 12, 12 of the record, it says typically you'll find one to 10 nanograms. And again, we're talking about billionths of the gram. But the whole point about the hair was that it was easily transferred, and counsel missed an opportunity to have an expert come in and say, look, we don't usually test this stuff because it's so low in relevance because it is so easily transferred. So the state and the circuit court shouldn't provide strategy calls um, that didn't exist in the mind of the lawyers based on thorough preparation at the time. This was not the guiding hand of counsel contemplated in Powell v. Alabama through Strickland through our current jurisprudence. We do not have to prove that not one reasonable lawyer would have done what these lawyers did. We have to prove that there was deficient conduct, and we have to prove that the deficient conduct undermined your confidence in this verdict, and we've done Counsel, that. Counsel, uh, you have exceeded your time, but go ahead and sum up in about 30 seconds, if you would. Sir, I, I would just ask you to reverse uh, the circuit court's opinion and remand this for a new guilt phase. Thank you. All right, we thank you uh, both for your arguments. Uh, the court will be uh, hearing the third case on today's docket uh, uh, virtually uh, at 11.30. Uh, the court will now stand in recess. Until All right. then.
Mic check, one, two, one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15.
See you later.
Order in the court. The Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. The Honorable Chief Justice Charles T. Kennedy presiding. The court will now take up the third case on today's docket, NRA amendments to Florida Rule of Appellate Procedure 9.143. I'll recognize uh, counsel for the petitioner, uh, Mr. Upson. May it please the court. My name is Keith Upson. And I appear this morning on behalf of the Appellate Court Rules Committee. Good morning. Thank you for allowing us to appear remotely. I had the honor of chairing the committee's criminal law subcommittee from the origin of this referral through the response to comments uh, filed in June in which we've proposed alternative language as to subsection C of our proposed new rule 9143. And I believe the committee's response to comments does a, a fantastic job of concisely noting the challenges we faced as well as memorializing for your consideration the majority and minority positions on many facets, uh, including many if not all of the concerns that were also raised by the commenters to the proposed rule. The majority of the committee consistently concluded that the amendments provision 16B6B, providing that victims have a right to be heard in any public proceeding involving pretrial or other release from any form of legal constraint, plea, sentencing, adjudication, or parole, and any proceeding during which a right of the victim is implicated, as well as 16B6G's right to be informed of all post-conviction processes and procedures and to participate in such processes and procedures must include appellate proceedings if those provisions by their plain language are to have any meaning at all. Now, perhaps it typically in a rules case, um, our response to comments expressly recognizes that if this court agrees with the commenters or um, with the majority position, or excuse me, the, the minority position from the committee, that the application of 16b6 to appellate proceedings is debatable or needs further judicial interpretation, the committee agrees that the adoption of an appellate rule would be premature at this time and should wait for this area of the law to be further developed. As we've proposed- Let me ask you, let me ask you a question about that. Uh, uh, you know, if I look at this revised rule of proposal, it 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 doesn't it doesn't really seem to presume that a right or or certainly what the scope of any right would be. It just says a victim seeking to invoke a right under Article One, Section Sixteen, and that it just seems this seems to be just more or less like a procedural framework. So for somebody to raise a right they think they might have, they, they seek to assert it. And then if there are arguments about whether they in fact have the right or not, then that can be hashed out in the context of that. Why, why would it be wrong to look at it that as the rule that you, have, uh, the revised rule uh, in that way? It's not really settling whether there's a right or not a right, but at least arguably there's a right. And if somebody seeks to assert it, this we're recognizing that that's how they ought to do it. Justice Kennedy, that, that's exactly what, what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying, particularly in the first subsection, by referring back to the definition of victim as provided for in uh, the amendment itself, uh, subsection B, directing trial court clerks to include in the record on appeal those things that the victims may have filed at the trial court level. But with the proposed revision to C, we have, have tried to leave that interpretation uh, of the limit and extent of such participation entirely with the judiciary. Um, having concluded 
among a majority of, of the full committee that appellate proceedings must, by the plain language of the amendment, be included. Um, we then turn to trying to consider whether whether having no rule at this time is better than providing some guidance or whether a more specific rule as the subsection C we originally approved and proposed and submitted to this court uh, would be better than a general rule. And at, at, at great lengths, we discussed whether or not the general rule before the court today is better or worse than having no rule at all because we removed even and, and I can tell you anecdotally, I don't, you have some of the minutes of, of my subcommittee meetings and, and I don't know that you have as a, appendices, those where we tried to flesh out putting a time limit, because at the very least, if you're gonna say a victim has a right to file, a, if you're gonna say a victim needs to file a, a motion in the court in which it seeks to invoke a right that exists constitutionally, there ought to at least be some time frame on it um, and we tried really hard to do that, but given the nature of the, the different proceedings on direct appeal, where there's a notice of appeal and a record versus original proceedings where neither of those could be triggering events, we found it more unwieldy and, and we instead recommended to the full committee, which in turn approved and which is now before you as, as that alternative subsection C far more general and I think is a practical matter um, to provide an amendment defined victim with the barest procedure by which they're on notice that if they want to avail themselves of a right under the amendment, they need to file something with the court in which the matter is pending outlining the nature and scope of what they would like that participation to be. Council under, under C1, uh, it provides that a victim may file a signed statement. Could that statement include items or things that are outside the record? Justice Polson, I, I think that's the number one alarm bell concern from both comments uh, and among members of the committee, myself included, because this is my practice. I almost exclusively represent criminal defendants on appeal and in original proceedings. Um, and after I calmed down, which is not to say the commenters had or had any reason to, and they can certainly, um, the PDA can certainly speak for themselves. I, I realized we've already got rules under which I could address that in a worst case scenario. Um, we can move to respond if, if in an extraordinary circumstance and only speaking for myself, it would have to be extraordinary for me to feel like I needed to respond. Um, I've been fortunate to appear in, in all such courts and I have confidence that my courts aren't going to be concerned with extra record material. Worst case, I could move to strike. Um, I think we can acknowledge practitioners aren't bashful about availing themselves of motions to respond or strike should they feel it, it, it rose to the level necessary. But the majority of the committee didn't feel like, uh, because one of the concerns raised by the F, FPDA is that this is gonna throw the briefing schedule akimbo and it's gonna introduce victims brief and then a, a reply to the victims, I mean, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the concern that's that's expressed. Was, was there a consideration of maybe perhaps just giving uh, like a MECA status to, to victims as opposed to participating uh, as a full party? Well, and, and that's, I sense that's in some ways a loaded question because it's not intended to be. <laughs> well, I mean, this, this court's already said, I believe in Butler last year. Um, no, I'm confused. Uh, it was in Butler that this court already said that what the, the victim's rights under uh, Section 16 are going to have to be subordinate if there's any conflict with the defendant's rights. But it was the first district in um, LT that said that this does not elevate the, the victim to party status. And, and we never considered that it did. So I want to be I want to be very clear. Um, 
and I know you're going to hear from the FPDA that, that in def, in, as a matter of fact, uh, if we allow them participate to the level originally pr proposed in C1, they'll be de facto party status to which we, we continue to, to disagree. Uh, there was, I, I do recall, and again, anecdotally, Justice Polson, some discussion in caution that we, actually, I think we did briefly consider procedure similar to the amicus procedure. But as, as I sit here before you today, I, I don't recall why that fairly quickly died on the vine. I think the most likely explanation, given the overall universe of the conversations and the things we've grappled with, our concern was that we not create things beyond the plain language of, of the amendment itself. And I, I think our concern probably would have been that that would have been above and beyond what the what the amendment contemplated or called for, and therefore not not a proper procedural rule. It only took me five minutes to get to the answer to your question, Justice Polson. If, if amicus uh, status uh, is required, let's say hypothetically, uh, would would it also uh, require us, uh, requires the appellate courts, uh, to permit uh, victims and, and whoever else is entitled to it? Uh, to, to hire counsel, to file amicus briefs, and to also uh, be provided with time to argue before us. Justice Labarga, I think that's exactly the concern that we not hang too much substance on the skeleton and a procedural rule at this time. And where I'm sure the Public Defenders Association is going to tell you, because there probably already are attorneys marketing themselves as victims counsel. Mm -hmm. And there will be such things filed. And, and this court, it, it's got to be on your radar that all these death penalty cases that, that you're going to suddenly have counsel for victims now asking to avail themselves of this. this. But the courts are going to have to sort it out. We don't think there's anything about our rule that we've proposed that's mutually exclusive to that or that oversteps the bounds of a simple procedure. It, it merely notifies amendment defined victims, um, at least in the, the revised proposed subsection C, that they're going to need to ask the court, this is what I'd like to do. And then whichever court that is, if it's this court or the fifth or the second, they can then say, how that court's going to handle it. And we also anticipate there will need to be revision to a 9143 should this court adopt it as more substance is defined as the limits and boundaries are, are defined in the judiciary. In, in light of that, what is the argument for adopting 9.143 even as it is revised now? It starts from the position that the majority of the of the full committee consistently reads 16 B as giving defined victims the right to participate in appellate proceedings. If this court agrees and they do have that right, we ultimately agreed having this general rule to be better to provide some guidance to those defined victims on how to ask to avail themselves of those rights. We felt it was literally the, the minimal threshold procedural process by which they could request the determining body, the court in which they're in front of, I would like to avail myself of these rights that I, that I now have. Counsel, you are, um, you're into your rebuttal time. I'm, I'm gonna give you a little extra time, but I just want you to be aware Thank you, Justice. With that, I'll, I'll leave that last minute. All right, and I'll give you a couple extra minutes um, uh, if you need it. Um, so from uh, opposing counsel. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, John Eddie Morrison from the Public, Florida Public Defenders Association. I join Mr. Upson's uh, uh, gratitude for allowing us to do this via Zoom. Um, I believe it's correct that Mr. Upson began his argument with a substantive 
argument as to whether or not uh, what's generally referred to as Marcy's law applies uh, in appellate proceedings. And I think that is absolutely correct. This is a substantive issue. To address Chief Justice Kennedy's first question, uh, the amended proposal still says that the victim may file a motion. And then the question is not whether the victim may participate. The only question is the proposed scope of the victim's participation. Well, what it says is a victim seeking to invoke a right under Article 1, Section 16 um, may, uh, may file a motion and setting forth the proposed scope. But it does that does not necessarily seem to me to presume the, the answer to the substantive question. It's just saying, okay, obviously this is, a, there, there's differences of opinion about whether uh, uh, any such motion uh, as a matter of, of a law substantively could be successful, whether there is any such right. But this is just saying, okay, if you want to seek to assert that there is such a right, and to, uh, to invoke it, then you um, to file a motion. Tell us about it. Now, I, I guess on the other hand, you can say, well, that's what people are going to do anyway, even without the rule. So it, it's just kind of, uh, it, it is a kind of bare bones thing that is maybe not much different than what would happen in the absence of a rule. Uh, yes, Your like, Honor. That's, that's an observation. Please respond. <laughs> uh, um, let me... Let me just game this through the way this would work in real life. Someone would file a motion, the victim would file a motion. Somebody will uh, object saying, no, there's no right under the uh, Article 1, Section 16. And the response would be, but the Florida Supreme Court already said, I may file a motion. That's the language of the rule. And the question then is the proposed scope of the victim's participation. Frankly, I think that's how every argument is going to go if this rule was to be adopted by the Well, court. I mean, it says seeking to invoke a right. I mean, um, I don't know. If, if, Your Honor, the only language I can see that would possibly sort of get to the real issue is the victim may or may not participate depending on substantive law to come. I mean, that that's really what the law, the substantive law here is. And the procedural rule needs to follow the substantive law. The real problem here is- But what you, what you don't want is something coming out that you think uh, kind of uh, uh, assumes um, or indirectly establishes substantive law on this point. Exactly, Your Honor. That's the concern. And the language may file a petition. And then when it talks about the issues, the scope of the participation, that already assumes the participation has- it, it will Of course, you know, that if we- if we issued this, uh, if we uh, uh, adopted this rule, there'd be an opinion with it, and an opinion could say that this does not decide uh, any substantive matter related to whether or not uh, such a right um, may be successfully invoked, whether such a right exists or may be successfully invoked. Your Honor, I have seen those caveats and opinions from this court for years, and then I have seen the DCA opinions saying, Florida Supreme Court is presumed to uh, enact or be constitutional and be correct. And this is true in every uh, every jury instruction case. I mean, it's it's an amazing dichotomy in the Florida law. I, I understand that you can say that in your opinion. Um, sometimes the deference to this court from the DCAs, I think is correct but it's maybe too much when you've said don't defer and they still defer and they do. That's, that's our real concern is that any language that looks like this court is leaning one way or the other. And, and the real issue for us is, I think when you have a real case in controversy with real facts and real parties, this will be much clearer as to whether the, the rule applies or not. Most uh, appeals, most criminal appeals, there, there's, there's no release issues involved. It's just a request for a new trial. It doesn't really fall under the provisions of Article 1, Section 16. Um, there is one provision that talks about 
uh, appeals, and it doesn't provide for participation, it provides for expediency. So there's, there's the, the drafters of this uh, constitutional language clearly thought about appeals. They knew about how to include language for appeals, and they deliberately did. I mean, there's a lot of, and all of these arguments will only become clear in the context of a very specific case. Is this case involving the possibility of release, of pretrial release or pretrial or other releases, the language from the uh, Constitution? That all of that can only happen, I believe, in the substantive law. I believe that this is premature. Uh, the, uh, uh, the suggestion that of course, uh, uh, victims could do this through the amicus procedure that currently exists. There wouldn't even be a need for another procedure. It already exists under the rules and that could then allow the development of this law. And, um, and Mr. Upson's absolutely correct. There are attorneys marking themselves as victims, or rights attorneys. This is uh, a burgeoning area of law. Um, uh, and um, and I am sure that these uh, such such motions and petitions we're seeing them in the trial courts. I'm sure we will see them in the trial courts, and then we can decide on a case by case basis that will then allow it to flush out. But we have a procedure already in place. Well, Mr. Morrison, think, sorry, what you what and what, what you're saying then is that that we're going to need to wait. What you're suggesting is that we wait until say a month from now. Uh, in a particular case coming before us, let's say a death penalty case or robbery case or rape case before us that uh, a, a victim uh, file a motion uh, de demanding pursuant to the constitution to appear before us. And only at that time do we deal with it? I think at that time you'll have specific facts and cases in controversy. And that, at that time you'll be able to say, is this case fall under the language of Marcy's law? Does this involve pretrial or other release? Or is this case just in a death penalty case? I know of no situation where there's a release from a death penalty. It's a new trial or new sentencing or something to, the, to that extent. Well, people but do get is, discharged. Yes. There, are the, there are cases where people get discharged. Your Honor, it's been a while. I don't recall well, one. I, must I, can, I can remember some not that long uh, ago. Your, your honor, your honor does more. I, I do not do death penalty work. Uh, and so uh, your honor's recollection and, uh, and knowledge is far superior to mine. I, I, I simply don't. Counsel, uh, counsel, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Are, are your yes, concerns sir. allayed or eliminated if subsection C drops away altogether? I'm, uh, that helps, your honor. Uh, I'm a little concerned about subsection B, which um, seems to allow the uh, victim to place things in the record on appeal, which may not be appropriate. Um, I, we have lesser concerns about that, uh, but, um, uh, if subs but at that point, candidly, Your Honor, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what we're doing. This is, this is very premature. If subsection C drops away, what does this rule do? It repeats the constitutional definition and it says, shall include any filing by a victim or authorized filer, which um, the, the rule has always been in appeals that the, the appellant is the captain of, of their own ship. They send forth the record on appeal. And then if the appellee has uh, something else they think should be included, they send that forward. There's a, there's a process for this. Um, and I can't see why that process would not work in this context. Again, if for some reason in a criminal case, in a criminal case, uh, defendants are always the appellant. Uh, if the state does not include appropriate statements, I guess in a, uh, as an amicus, the uh, a victim could come in and say, you know, you really should also look at this probably, as Justice Polson suggested, extra record uh, inappropriate uh, material, and the court can make a decision on that. Um, so, but without Section C, I'm not sure what this rule does, Your Honor. Um, it, it, I think that really highlights the, uh, the premature nature 
So how does Section C, though, go beyond? So in, in the Constitution itself, in Section 16C, it talks about the victim uh, or their lawyer being able to assert and seek enforcement of the rights enumerated in this section, blah, 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 in any trial or appellate court um, as a matter of right. I mean, other than just saying you basically do that by filing a motion and then to be determined what your rights might be, uh, what since we already have that provision in the Constitution, is it doing harm? I mean, what, what's the what's the downside of having what's proposed? The downside is exactly as uh, Justice Kennedy and I's uh, conversation uh, indicated that no, I, I wasn't agreeing with you. Don't get don't, I, I, I wasn't I, I wasn't uh, I didn't uh, take your response to my comment. <laughs> yes, I, I did not uh, take your comments as uh, um, the green, I that was that I'm referring to the conversation, and um, uh, and in that conversation, my concern, the concern is the court in promulgates language, suggesting that it agrees that there is a, a right to participate on any specific situation. Right. Do you have a Do you have a problem though in principle if we if we already have in the Constitution that you can assert your rights? In, it re refers to appellate courts. It says that you can do so as a matter of right. Do you have a problem in principle with the rules telling people without commenting on sort of what the merits of their request might be, how you mechanically go about asserting your rights under 16C? Uh, the, under 16C, the, at least both the proposed and the, the original versions, Essentially, the the language indicates that the victims are um, uh, part of, of this proceeding, at least a quasi party, if not a party, and that that is that is inappropriate. The the language your honor referred to says that you can assert the rights uh, earlier uh, in the in the constitutional amendment. The question is, does that apply? Does that apply in a criminal appeal? Is there any right in a criminal appeal where the issue isn't released? But the issue is uh, new trial. Is is is, is that um, and, and the th that is all substantive law that needs to be worked out on a case by case basis. And a broad statement by this court that you may file this, and then especially under the uh, 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 the, the new proposal, and then the, it's a question of proposed scope. Really gets this exactly backwards. It says we're going to decide that you can file that's the substantive issue and the proposed scope of what you're going to be able to do all that procedure is going to be left up to each and every dca panel maybe the dcas as a whole and each dca will decide something differently Th that, that really i think that sort of highlights the fundamental problem with these rules without the substantive law th this just doesn't work Fundamentally, this just is not working. Mr. Morrison, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I've, I've heard your reason why you thought it was problematic to do what, what I sort of view as perhaps an interim rule, because it seems to me that if, if, if the substantive issues determine that victims don't have this right, then the rule would go away, we'd repeal it, so it'd be interim in that respect. If we determine that they do have that right, once we get some experience with it, we probably would want to amend it to to put some other procedures in. So, I mean, it, it's an interim rule. I, I don't know that we've done that before, but I also don't see a problem and do see the advantage of telling people just do this until we figure it out. I have a, a high degree of confidence that we can write an opinion that explains that this is not deciding the substantive issue. And I also have a high degree of confidence that our DCA judges will be able to read that opinion and understand that we haven't decided the substantive issue. So other than that concern that, that this will indicate that the substantive issue has been decided, is there any other reason why this would be a bad idea? If, if the court wanted to do that, then it would it really was, then you'd be sent back to the committee. There would have to be an entire procedure. I didn't, I didn't follow what you said about sending it back to the committee. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Let, let me, in 15 seconds. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a little more time. If, if um, I, if there was to be an interim rule and uh, specifically reserving the issue of any substance, then the rule would need to say, essentially, the defendant's uh, 
uh, usually the defendants or the state also would has has an opportunity to respond as to whether there there is a right under the constitution to uh, and there would be a whole separate uh, issue of litigation of that and that would require a whole another procedural there's a motion there is a uh, a right to respond so that it's clear but, within but, the but, rule but i mean it, it, isn't it kind of either understood or there's some general provision in the rules that if some if one party files an emotion that the response can be or file, filed by the people that have an adverse position in the case i i think it would need to be clear that the once the the, the motion only triggers the issue of whether there is a substantive right that that's that's the uh, and anything short of that um, and particularly the language here, the scope of the victim's participation scope is a real problem because that implies procedure, uh, when, how, um, not whether, which is the sub. And there would have to be some sort of the committee. What if it said nature? What if it scope? said nature and scope? I mean, the, the word. I mean, the word proposed is in there. Um, uh, the word proposed is in there. Uh, yes, indeed the but the, but the, that seems to be limiting the question to uh uh the how when where but not the whether they can participate at all whether there's any current uh constitutional right in this particular situation at all um and if i i look the um uh, I have not run this by the elected public defenders because this simply is a proposal that was not before us was not promulgated but the um uh if if there was to be some sort of interim rule with some sort of procedure like that there would have to be a clear procedure where it's clear that that triggers the substantive uh decision not uh something else there's a number of ways right. to yeah, do that but if, i think that requires more drafting. if you if you're you're over your time go ahead and sum up in about 30 seconds if you would uh, Your Honor, uh, I think I have. This is substantive. This is not procedural. This court should wait. That would be the recommendation to the FPDA. Thank you so much for your time and attention to this uh, matter. Okay, thank you. Mr. Upson. Thank you, Chief Justice. I, I, I don't want to do this. You're hungry. Um, to, to answer your, your question, because I had the luxury of not having to participate at the time, it's 9300A that provides that with one exception, a party has 15 days within service of a motion to file a response. So we've already got a rule to file a response. I, I didn't have enough time to look up what that one exception was. It was uh, 9420. It's probably, not, it's probably not the Victim's Rights Amendment. It, it, but I'm not familiar in my, in my practice. I'm not familiar with 9420. So I, I didn't scroll that far. But Fundamentally, and, and I, I think because the the reply to the response, I, I believe is so well written. I think we've, if nothing else, we've identified that there are a lot of issues here and there have been a lot of, there are a lot of concerns within the committee as well. Um, I think it comes down from the, the position of the, the majority of the committee, and I'm going to go in reverse order, 16B6G in post-conviction proceedings that says the victims have the right to be informed of and to participate. That's got to include 9140 and 9141. That's got to include appeals. Less clear, but still dispositively clear, 16B6B and that catch-all, any proceeding during which a right of the victim is implicated. I think clearly the amendment gave victims the right to participate to some extent in appeals. They didn't say any enumerated proceeding, any of these things we just listed, it said any proceeding. So then the question becomes, are appeals a situation where the rights of the victim become implicated? I don't think this is a situation where the committee has put the cart before the horse and we need to, I don't think it's a substantive issue. I think the argument is nonsensical if you think the rights of the victim aren't implicated on appeal. And the hypothetical I will give in three seconds is I think we all agree the victim has a right to attend the defendant's sentencing. The defendant is sentenced. The defendant is remanded two years later 
the victim receives a notice of a status conference in the trial court. What's the, I don't, what is this? The, the victim goes to court. The circuit court judge brings the defendant out and says, well, I've got this DCA opinion that says that we violated speedy. They have vacated your judgment and sentence and you are discharged. Good day, sir. Go about your life. The victim in that situation has absolutely no idea what's happened in the interim. Unless we agree any proceeding during which the right of a victim is implicated includes that entire appellate process. The majority of the committee continues to maintain if you agree that Section 16 doesn't apply to appellate proceedings, then never mind. There's nothing to see here. But if it grants victims the rights that we read that it grants the victims to rights, we overwhelmingly believe having some rule, even a vague rule, to provide some guidance is better than no rule at all. So are you saying you would object to court commentary that sort of punted on the substance, as opposed to just doing something in the opinion that may get lost in the, the midst of whatever? I'm, I'm sorry, just I'm, putting something in. I mean, it seems like the conversation earlier was going to, you know, having to say something. You obviously have a view on the substantive issues and a view on the rule. It seems like there's another way of looking at the rule that would say, you know, say that it kind of punts on the nature of the substantive rights. Um, would you have a problem with court commentary to the rule as opposed to just saying it in the opinion, court commentary that says, you know, the promulgation of this rule doesn't mean that, you know, we've determined what substantive rights to participate, you know, any victim might have in an appellate proceeding? Nope, nope. No problem with that at all. I, th I think we'll all feel a lot better when we do have more guidance. So if it's uh, some of the detail that was suggested earlier, because this court can write an opinion that fleshes this out right now, I don't think it's necessary. I think because this court can provide more substance doesn't make the proposed rule a substantive rule that needs to wait. But similarly, to, to directly answer the question that was asked, we wouldn't have any problem with the court saying, implementation of this general rule in no way passes on the substance at this time. I think that memorializes the spirit of what we were trying to accomplish. We were trying to provide some framework with the awareness we're probably going to have to amend or... You sort of confused me when you came back and said, um, but if you don't think we're right substantively, then you should just not adopt the rule. I mean, I think that's... Well, it's 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 kind of buried on the last page above the signatures and the and the response to recommendations. But the, the majority of the committee has already discussed. If this court agrees with the, the commenters that no right to participate in appeals was created by. The I mean, I, I think the suggestion is <laughs> that we, we generally don't decide those substantive issues in rules cases. We, we want to wait and let some. I mean, so. Uh, and I wouldn't want to decide that here in this case, one way or the other. And what I think Justice Kennedy and others were suggesting was that this, this, the way it's written, it doesn't assume a right of participation or what it involves, but the rule would give parties guidance as a point. They, they, could, they could file something and say, we want to file an amicus brief and there could be no objection and we just go on. Or they could file something and say, I want to, uh, designate something else from the record of appeal, and then the other side could object and say they don't have the right to do that under the Constitution, and then that would get litigated and decided. So, um, but but I, I don't think I personally wouldn't want to decide one way or the other whether the right exists. So I, I wouldn't want to agree or disagree with the majority. And if, if that's the case, um, you're saying we should just not adopt the rule if we don't agree or disagree? I. Thank, thank you for the opportunity, Justice, to, to explain it. We believe that the rule as proposed, as revised, doesn't create any substance, but merely provides the procedural framework by which this can all be sorted out by the judiciary. Okay. I got all hungry right. too, so. All right. Uh, that sounds... Uh, um... Unless you have something else to say, we've gone over a little bit here, but we uh, uh, 
thank you all for, or thank you both for your uh, uh, participation today and for the work you've uh, put into this rule. We appreciate it. That concludes uh, this uh, argument and this session of the Florida Supreme Court.